I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Olga Vargas. I am the sub team leader for GPR on the technology focus team. And um, we started these webinars about a year ago. And we've been, um, since Jim uh, Doolittle's retirement, we've been trying to um, keep track of where all our equipment is, where our users are. You know, we've had more retirements and um, trying to get new users on board, making sure everybody's taking um, advantage of this um, great resource and also trying to support each other. Um, so this is a map we have our, um, of our current locations of what we know of where our qu equipment and operators are. If there's any updates to this map, um, please email myself or Chad and let us know. Um, and we will be answering um, questions at the end of today's um, presentations. So if you guys can hold your, but feel free to put them in the chat as we go along so you don't forget. So as I mentioned, we started these webinars um, a year ago. Uh, we had one as a combined um, technology focus team um, last January. And the radar presentation starts at 32 minutes in, not that you should skip the earlier presentation. Um, and then we had one um, this past August. And that was a really good one too, because we had Peter Leach, who is works for GSSI, go over um, rating. And um, during his presentation, we had some really good questions. And a minute in, an hour into it, I put down the hour and ten minutes into it. Um, so Jim had asked about salt, um, salt marshes. And um, he gave us some really good pointers on filtering out data. And that really sparked this next webinar that we're holding today. And then uh, I just wanted to remind you that we do have um, some files stored on our team's um, page where we have um, some of Jim's old documents, some of his videos. And um, if you have trouble finding any of the resources that you uh, we're utilizing previously, just let us know. We'll do our best to um, track them down. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Jim and Maggie and let Jim start his presentation. And thank you again, Jim, for um, showing us all um, your new hyperstacking antenna, which we'll all be really <laughs> jealous of, and um, letting us know these how to. Uh, progress on these difficult um, soil types, so thanks. Yeah, I'm actually going to start old school and go analog. So um, okay. again, I wasn't exactly sure of everybody's background on the radar and preparing there. I probably should have should have gotten, um, you know, a little more on my audience there, knowing that most people are operators. But um, here it goes. Uh, so good morning. Um, uh, just a little bit about me again. I started in 1987 fresh out of URI, uh, mapping soils as a district county um, soil mapper for the Middlesex County Soil Survey. Middlesex County is just west of Boston, um, mix of urban and um, uh, forested type of county um, from 89 to 2003, pretty much a ground pounder going out mapping soils. I did become the operator for the Massachusetts um, unit. We bought a mass bought a SUR 3. I think in 86 or so, and um, um, the state soil scientist assigned me to be the operator for that. That's how I got involved at Jim. Um, can the project leader working on the Plymouth County Soil Survey, which I'm gonna focus on most of the work um, that we did there on histosols and cranberry beds. 2003, Jim, I moved back, oh. Did you start sharing? We can't see your screen. Ah, that's, oh yeah. Sorry, uh, again, new at this, not really. Uh, let me go back. <laughs> I thought I was sharing. Share. All right. There we go. Can you see it now? Perfect. Okay, my bad. Uh, no, you didn't miss much. Uh, so 2003, came back home to Rhode Island as the assistant state soil scientist, mostly working on coastal zone soil survey, um, but also still doing some radar and technical soil services there. Um, the radars I've used, I went from a SIR 3 to a SIR 2000, which was probably my favorite unit up until now. 
I got a Sir 3000 hand me down from Maine. And was it two years ago? I, it's kind of a blur, but about two years ago, um, we had some funding at the end of the year and I purchased a HS 2000 or 200 um, megahertz unit, which we'll talk about later. Um, so again, just uh, probably this is nothing new to you, but um, GPR has been used for soil surveys since the eight, early 80s. I believe, Jim, the, the first use was for sinkholes in Florida investigations on cars topography. Um, radar works by transmitting high frequency, short duration pulses of electromagnetic energy into the ground um, from an antenna. Those signals uh, travel through the ground when they encounter changes in electrical properties. A part of that signal is bounced off and returned to the antenna processed by the brain um, and um, provided in a nice um, real-time chart of the ground features. So when you're looking at a radar profile, the horizontal distance um, is the distance the antenna has traveled. The vertical scale is the two-way travel time, which we can convert to a depth scale um, by calculating the velocity there. Uh, can you see my, um, my mouse? Yeah. Yes. All right, it's probably white on white, but there uh, there is a video again. Um, you can put that in a link, but it's just the uh, the geophysical one that kind of gives you a nice little overview of how GPR works. Uh, the antenna selection, basically, if you want to go deep, you use a low frequency antenna, but you compromise resolution. If you want to go shallow, you use high frequency um, and you get higher resolution, but you don't go as deep. So it's really a trade off of what you what you want to see and how deep you want to go. Uh, the company has a lot of different ones. Uh, this one shown on the picture is the 80 megahertz beast uh, that I did get from Jim, and it's pretty much sat in a van for 20 years. <laughs> Never used it. weighed weighed about 80 pounds, and um, you know it's it's almost like too too big. But that's a really low frequency antenna, probably for profiling deep um, ponds or or lakes or something like that. I I think I did get a request to use it on um, glacial ice up in Alaska one year. Um, so the most common ones we use are 200 and 400 megahertz. My favorite one was the 120, but I guess with FCC regs, that one's no longer allowed to use. Um, so the depth of penetration really depends on the antenna. We did manage to get 70 feet, I think was our deepest, out on a Wareham outwash plane, uh, which are in quartzy cements using a, a, a dual band 100 megahertz antenna. Uh, uses, uh, Jim wrote this, Classic paper in 87 called Using GPR to Increase the Efficiency and Accuracy in Soil Survey. Um, if you haven't read it, it pretty much was the paper that said, you know, this is a tool soil scientists want to use um, to do exactly what it says, increase efficiency and the accuracy of soil survey. Other uses is archaeological uses. I, I know Rhode Island, we, we have a vacancy announcement out for an archaeologist, so I'll probably be working with them, um, you know, before you go out and dig random pits run a radar and try to find areas to focus your investigation on. Um, Connecticut uh, and other states have done a lot of work with state archaeologists looking anywhere from vampires to, um, you know, all kind of all kind of stuff for archaeology there. Uh, technical soil services. Um, if you are doing technical soil services, kind of remind you to make sure you work um, with your partners because we don't want to compete with the private sector and you know, cause cause some issues there, but there's a lot of uses for you know basically um, uh, geology in a box, as our, our geologists used to call it there. So a lot of a lot of use for tech soil services, groundwater investigations. Um, I think the the worst day I ever had was with Jim out in Illinois, in Mosquito Country, looking uh, at groundwater studies that he was working on there. Uh, got killed by mosquitoes doing doing that and pull, pulling a radar for miles and miles on that thing. Um, engineering applications, obviously dam work, pot, you know, pond um, volume estimates, stuff like that. Uh, the, one of the classic uses here is depth of bedrock in our bedrock control complexes, percentages of very deep to very shallow soils. Um, locating buried objects, I've used it for trying to find old tile drains for a WRE restoration, uh, buried tanks for FRPP, make sure there's no, you know, issues with contaminants or anything like that. And then a lot of use for research um, research studies. I'll kind of show those. Uh, again, if you're doing research on a, on a field, it's best to run the radar around and try to find what the variability in the soils are. 
Uh, so the area we're focusing on is uh, southeastern Massachusetts. This is southern New England right here. Uh, the circle kind of shows the heart of um, cranberry country. Uh, Massachusetts being, I think, the second largest producer of cranberries in the country. That might have changed, but back in the 90s, we were number one. Um, so um, the use of uh, GPR for the cranberry beds, uh, again, in 1999, a complete remap of that Plymouth County was um, began, uh, not just a, an update, but a, a complete remap. Um, so at that time, Jim would come down every you know, twice a year or maybe once a year, uh, spend a week with the, the radar operators to make sure they're um, kept up on the latest technology, the training, um, and then just, again, trying to find best uses for the radar. So each year we would select um, uh, areas to have him go out and work with us. Um, he'd be at the office at four in the morning. Uh, <laughs> um, and basically um, one of the sites we selected was an abandoned bog called the Vallisville bog that um, we were contacted with. Um, our DC said the grower wanted to bring it back into production um, and wanted to know more about the soils. So we said, oh, let's try pulling the radar on it. So the geology map here is just kind of a, a generalized map of southeastern Massachusetts. You'll note these large end moraines or recessional moraines. Um, they mark the retreat positions of the glacial ice, the Wisconsin and glacial sheet, uh, probably about um, 20 to 18,000 years ago. And then on the south side of these or downside of these moraines are large pitted outwash plains. Um, and the word pitted is in there to tell you that they're um, just loaded with kettle holes and um, um, yeah, pitted outwash plain. So this was the actual profile we got from this um, first time we were doing it in Plymouth County. And it was basically kind of like a eureka moment. When the radar works well, we want to go back and keep using it for that operation. And the, the first pull across the bog was actually a transect we did this way here. This is a nice classic profile of a peat filled kettle hole of the bog. You can see now we have actual soil map units that we'll talk about a little later. But once we ran that, we said, oh, the radar works really well on these acid peat soils or histosols that we have. So um, if you're not familiar with what a kettle bog is, basically as the ice is retreating, blocks of ice become detached, buried in uh, stratified sand and gravel, glacial fluvial deposits. It remains there for upwards of a thousand years, geologists believe. And then eventually the ice melts out and a depression is formed. Um, the fate of that depression can be one of three things. It can just be a dry kettle hole. If it's the ice block was big enough to intercept the water table, it can become a kettle pond. Uh, example of that is Warden's, uh, Walden Pond in, in Massachusetts, which is over 100 feet deep. So that was a giant kettle block that formed uh, Walden Pond. Or um, it can fill in with organic material and become a peat filled kettle hole, as we call it. So this is an actual kettle on a, on a glacial uh, landform starting to form there. Um, so cranberry farming, if you're not familiar, it's very intensive form of agriculture. Um, the older beds are mostly on these um, organic kettle bogs that were Atlantic white cedar swamps. They removed the trees, lit the, the, bo um, the bog on fire, let it burn for several, if not tens of years until it hit the water table, went out and was leveled. And then they began putting cranberries on the level um, barren area there. So the beds are consist of a series of ditches, dikes, ponds, gravel pits um, around the, 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 uh, the bogs are um, flooded uh, for harvesting. So the dikes are basically there to segregate bogs um, for different areas to be harvested at each time. The ditches also uh, are used to, to, to flood the bogs there. Um, so berries are either dry or wet harvested in the fall. It's a good tourist attraction there when the cranberry harvest is on. And there is quite a bit of use of herbicides and pesticides on the beds. So that's another thing we'll talk about. Um, and then some of the older beds, when they become unleveled and out of, uh, out of whack, basically, they'll go in level them, scrape them off, and then re-sand re, um, the bogs there. So then I'd also added that cranberry farmers are very protective of their beds. They're basically dealing with wetland issues, and they can be a little bit testy to work with. Um, and 
the radar actually really helped us out when we were mapping soil. So I'll talk about that later. But, well, so just a little bit on cranberries. Again, we're talking about Vaccinia macrocarparn. Um, it got its name because it looks like a crane, a cranberry, I guess it was called. Um, the beds are sanded. I guess on Cape Cod, they found after a big hurricane event, some sand blew onto one of the cranberry beds and noticed that it was it was actually helpful uh, in establishing new vine and getting the, the roots, the, the vine to hold into the organic material. So they're um, sanded every two to five years, I guess, with about an inch of sand. Um, they hope for ice so they can ice sand. If not, they have to do uh, water sanding. Uh, this photo just shows what a cranberry harvest looks like. They'll uh, agitate the uh, ponded flooded uh, bed. Uh, the cranberries float up to the top, find which way the wind's blowing, and you uh, harvest the, the cranberries um, out and truck them up to ocean spray to make some cranberry juice uh, for your vodka. Um, so if you look at a cranberry bed soil, you'll notice these alternating layers of sand and organic material. You can almost count how old this bed is by the, the alternating layers. The original sand was a nice thick deposit. And then below that, you can see the uh, the buried histosol. That's a free town soil underneath there. So you got about, you know, a, a 20 inches or so of sandy material on a, a low strength organic material. So you're going to get some subsidence it deals to deal with there. So following that Eureka movement, uh, the soil survey party we met with a bunch of growers, some of the big the big growers in the areas, Ocean Spray, Cape Cod Cranberry, and we wanted to just basically spend um, the entire week of Jim's time exploring how um, the GPR could be used for the industry and how could our soil survey data be uh, uh, improved. So some of the issues they came up with was dike construction. Again, you're, you've got a dike on a, a organic soil. Note those excavators in the back there. Um, some of the beds had sinkholes. They put a lot of weight on these soils, uh, uh, low strength soils, and they would basically form a, a, a collapse or a sinkhole. Pond maintenance, they require a lot of water to flood these beds. So um, they had to always have their, um, their, their ponds dredged out, deepened, uh, you know, similar water issues. That's what's going on pretty much everywhere. How are the pesticides moving through the um, soils? bog iron and, and that sort of thing. So this is an older bed being renovated right here with the new layer of sand. Um, and then they're going to put the vine on top of it. Those excavators there, if they go into this organic soil, this can happen where you're uh, pretty much losing a little bit of equipment right there. Um, this was a, a dike that was being constructed probably on a mineral soil. And then all of a sudden the excavator went out into the peat filled kettle and that's a come up for air on that one. So right off the bat, we have a, a, a user radar there to, you know, prior to dike construction, go out and determine what the soils are. Uh, this is the crew um, talking a little earlier with the state soil sign. Um, once we started doing this, word got out um, pretty, pretty rapidly spread that, oh, we got this new technology. The, the, the growers called it the orange box. They want to drag down there on their beds. So Dick wanted to come out and see what we're doing. I think he he wanted to spend a you know a day just cranberry country hanging out. That wasn't going to happen. We put him as a head musher, pulling um, the radar, the Sur three is in back here on a wheelbarrow with a twelve volt battery. So I think he got about a hundred pounds of weight. Planks. Jim's in back pulling a hundred twenty antenna, and you can see the flags there. Those flags had to be surveyed in um, for us to create a grid. So this is actually that one Kinko bog that I showed earlier on the uh, aerial image here, the one of our largest beds. Um, the planks are because we had to cross these ditches. Uh, so we had a crew up ahead, constantly moving planks. So it was a lot of work. Um, we also had to establish just, just a grid. This is pre-GPS. So we actually spent a whole day just having to create a, a, a ground survey grid so we could basically relate that to an XYZ location for creating the contour plot. And this is the end result. We would get a nice um, enter the XYZ data into Surfer, which was a gridding program, I guess probably before ArcMap came out. Um, it's still used pretty pretty widely today. Um, uh, but this was uh, kind of another one of these eye openers. Once we started showing the growers what their bogs look like, you know, without uh, the organic material, um, they really enjoyed um, 
the data and we kept getting more and more requests to go out there. So it actually worked out making us kind of friends with these people that normally would not like us going on, on their beds there. And the thing I'd like to point out is um, this is the final bed with soil map units there. You can see how the dikes are crossing this way. So basically crossing these kettles. So what happens is where you have one of these ridges, this, this bed actually has three different kettle blocks that formed it separated by ridges on here. Um, the areas where you had the deep organic, I don't know if you can see the water on here, but this dike is con continually subsiding every year. They have to come on and add more and more material. But when they hit this mineral material, it's not. So they would have an uneven issue with this bed and trying to flood it was, was difficult. If they had this data before, they could have easily put a dike this way and one kind of this way here rather than the way they had it. So again, this kind of opened up uh, another use for the for the radar there. In the mid 90s, we required these Rockwell plugger GPR, uh, GPS units, which were really accurate um, handheld left over from Gulf War, I guess. Um, and that allowed us to no longer have to deal with gridding the bog with a, a, a transit and uh, level. Uh, we could go out now and mark the XY location on our plugger, click a waypoint on the GPR, and then um, streamline the work, especially if we had ice here, um, just have a, people pull it, walk and click basically. And the other nice thing was with GIS, we had ArcView 2.0, I believe at this time, um, we can now overlay it onto nice uh, ortho imagery and further highlight you know, what, what their bed looks like uh, on it. Jim also was able to create these nice little time slices using Radian, I think, which was just coming out. And basically, I, I did a cost benefit analysis showing that using the, the, the GPS and GPR together saved a lot of money and, and really allowed us to, to go out and collect a lot more data on these beds pretty much all winter long. We didn't we didn't have indoor winters uh, in Plymouth County. We were out doing radar uh, work on cranberry beds. Oh, uh, this just shows you a nice uh, profile showing three different soil map units, your terra. Uh, your your deep organics, your mineral, very poorly drained soil, and then your Terek um, Swansea soils in through here. With this information, we're able to develop soil map units. I think we have upwards of seven of them to map the cranberry beds based on thickness of organic, type of mineral material, what the underlying geology is. Um, just another one showing you some cranberry bogs on glacial till soils. The radar is good at mapping out stratified versus non-stratified material. And this is a finished product. We went from just mapping all the cranberry beds in Massachusetts, mapping, just draw a line around the bed, call us in and bog, don't even have to go out there. Uh, but again, didn't provide any interpretive value to the same area, mapped seamlessly from the upland uh, terrestrial soils through the organic material. So uh, again, this was just an improvement of our soils data to try to um, provide more more interpretive value. Um, so some of the uses we came up with was I mentioned best placement for dike. So again, this dike is on mineral material and then your organic soil start around and through here. I think Maggie, this is the one you're going to talk about too, Tidmarsh um, here. And as this this dike is subsiding, it's actually bringing um, um, some of the, the, the cranberry bogs with it. So they're losing productivity there. All kind of horror stories about dike construction there. Uh, bed leveling settlement, again, know your soils before you go out and start renovating it. Um, maybe you might, might want, might not want to take that excavator out on some areas. Engineering, we did have something called a million dollar dike um, where the soil scientists, NRCS was cost sharing to put a dike to separate this bed from this pond. We dragged the radar and saw that it was a very deep organic soil and actually almost, almost, um, very fluid material underneath it. So we said, you can't put a dike here. Engineers said, oh, we can use geotextiles, uh, no problem. Um, soil scientists were right uh, that the dike failed and cost us quite quite a bit of money there. So always trust your soils, people. Uh, mapping deeper, uh, why do we stop at two meters? This is Donald Parozek with a nice deep Macaulay of a, of a peat bog here. Um, so uh, again, there's been a lot of work trying to, trying to trying to justify why why should we stop mapping at two meters when we have the technology to go deeper. Um, basin volumes with those contour plots, uh, two and three D, we can actually use Surfer to determine what the volume of this basin is. This is a a, a pond that's actually a freshwater soil, 
in Rhode Island. That's 45 feet peat, uh, deep of peat. You can see my uh, my my um, steel rods here go out 45 feet. Um, so we were able to calculate the the base and volume of this of this um, organic soil, and it's 84 million cubic feet of peat. So if you start dealing with carbon or carbon banking, this is a, a huge amount of carbon being sequestered there. Uh, mapping Ortstein layers. So some of these, a lot of these beds, there's actually a book called Cranberry to Cannonballs, where they, um, a lot of the beds were mined for the, the bog iron uh, to make cannonballs. And some of the growers claim that it was so cemented that they would have to um, dynamite to get through some of the uh, Ortstein layers in the soil. So we were able to use the, the, the radar to map out the, uh, the Ortstein. Um, how firm it was, and also areas that were not. So we had two different map units based on whether they have Ortstein or not. Uh, depth of water table, this is that profile I mentioned in Illinois where I walked for a while, but you can use it to determine um, groundwater direction and flow. Um, pesticide use, uh, again, before we entered any of these bogs, we would have to go to the pump station and determine whether or not there was pesticides being applied. So a lot of the early hydrology studies was trying to see if this water, these bogs are isolated from the aquifer and the pesticides are not moving into it. Um, research, we also I acquired a paper from Brown University um, where somebody said, oh, this group is out there coring in a, in a bog. So I, I talked to the person and she sent me this paper. And the interesting thing was it mentioned these coarse sand lenses, uh, carbonate spike right here. Uh, um, organic mud and sand lenses. And when, while we were doing these radar profiles, we kept noticing this layer of uh, look like mineral material and then underlain by organics. It was too deep for us to hit, but I sent this to the researcher and she like called me up immediately and said, we got to meet and go over this. And, and we basically spent uh, another week just out vibacoring and, and trying to figure out what this was. Um, I think the consensus was it's the younger, younger driest um, uh, period where we had cold permafrost conditions for thousands of years or so. Uh, just some of the uses I'm almost done here. Uh, again, just mapping histosol. So typically when we map uh, large swamps, we kind of consider it easy acres. You just go out, you stick your, uh, your, your Dutch auger, if you bury it, it's one soil. If you hit mineral, it's another. Um, but we feel that, you know, due to the importance of carbon and, um, you know, all the, the uses that we just came up with, that we should actually transect these, these uh, large swamps, bogs, marshes, um, and map them out to the series level there. So this is just a nice thick cut of a, a, a peat. Uh, deposit up in Maine there uh, with the with the radar data there. Uh, we do have over 600,000 acres of histosols within that um, soil survey area. That's roughly the size of Rhode Island. So all of Rhode Island could be, um, you know, mapped out as a as a histosol if, if we go by the acreage there. So um, map it. Uh, the font, one of the other uses was in 2010, we started doing freshwater subaqueous soils. We had a grad student at URI who is uh, doing his thesis on freshwater soils. And again, the radar works beautifully on, on these freshwater um, soils because it provides not only bathymetry, uh, so in here we could do a bathymetric map, uh, but it also tells you what's below there. So again, on here I'm looking at about four different soil map units um, just on this one transect. Um, bathymetry on, on these freshwater ponds doesn't always work because a lot of them have very thick SAV and the uh, acoustics don't go through the SAV, but the radar doesn't even uh, care about the uh, the SAV. So it's way better to use for um, bathymetry than um, standard um, acoustic methods. And that's just a map showing a freshwater subaqueous soil survey with our new uh, Tuckertown soil, which is a um, frazi wasist, separate um, frazi wasist soil. So that radar profile is kind of going right across and through here. Um, this uh, final use is uh, using for regulatory purposes. We were involved with a large um, wetland violation in the mid 90s um, and knowing that the radar can map where the organic soils end and the mineral soils begin, we were able to use the radar to basically delineate um, this, these hydric soil map units 55 and 60 from a non hydric unit there. So it does have uses for regulatory um, purposes. 
there. Uh, and then the final one is just um, salt marsh. So normally when you th think of radar, um, it works in highly resistive soils. You would never think of using it on a tidal marsh or even in heavy clay, like the Virgen's clays up in Vermont there. But with this new hyper stocking, hyper stacking technology, um, Olga mentioned that the workshop with the geophysical person, and he actually showed a, a marsh and that kind of raised my attention. So I, I emailed him back and he sent me the uh, settings to do on a marsh. And I took it out to this marsh in my town and ran it. And lo and behold, we were getting data. Um, uh, this is nanoseconds, not, not meters or anything like that. But I see uh, useful data um, throughout the profile on through here. So there is promise of uh, now being able to use GPR for salt marshes, which we're doing a major work on trying to remap these um, coastal blue carbon deposits there. So I uh, have to go out later in the, in the season and figure out if this is actually the peat mineral interface or some other interface there. But um, this is might be a game changer if this new technology can work on these salty soils and also uh, clay soils there. And I think that's about it. There's me at the Rhode Island White House there using the radar and there's my Beavis and Butthead sketch. Any questions or do we want to wait till the end? Um, I, I think we're going to wait till the end um, okay. so we can turn it over to Maggie and I did um, answer a couple in the chat. But thank right. you so much and I love those pictures. They were really good. <laughs> All right, great. Well, I will. Thanks, Jim, for that, for all that information. I am going to take over here, so I'll share my screen. Um, can y'all see that? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Jim. So, I am Maggie Payne. I am the state soil scientist for Massachusetts and Vermont. I started with NRCS in 2004 as a as an intern working with Jim in Rhode Island um, and so all of the all of my GPR knowledge has come from working with him and Jim Doolittle as well. Um, so I am currently located in Massachusetts and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the the uses that I've that I've used the GPR for here in mostly in the same area that Jim was just talking about, southeastern Mass, looking at the cranberry bogs um, in and the peat depths there. So going forward, let's see. So Jim showed this little diagram and talked to, talked a lot about what type of soils we have here in southeastern Mass and and what we have for the in these cranberry bogs. So the the like he said, we're on this pitted out wash plane. The GPR works really well for identifying that interface between those organic soil materials and the, the glacial fluvial, the outwash material down below that. And so this is just a little diagram of what some of those different soil types are that we have. They include the Swansea and Freetown soils are the organic soils. Freetown are the deep, deep organics greater than 51 inches. Swansea is 16 to 51 inches of organic over that uh, mineral material. And so using the GPR, we can really identify what those depths are. We also have, um, as Jim had noted, the, the sanded surface on the bogs. And so that shows in this diagram here, of usually it's about uh, one to two feet of sand over the surface of all of these areas. And so that's also identifiable in the GPR profile. I haven't done a lot with with measuring that depth because it's usually pretty standard across the whole bog. Uh, mostly what we're looking for in in this little yellow and red diagram that I have, the GPR, we're identifying that that bottom of the peat um, interface where it interfaces with the mineral soil below. The process that I use is, so this is a, these are this is the equipment that I have currently. I have a I use a 200 megahertz antenna. I don't have the new hyper stacking unit, um, so I have an older one of these antennas. I have the Sir 4000 from GSSI, and then it's linked up again, just like Jim's to this geode um, GPS unit. And so we that's the those are the types of equipment that I have out on the bogs. The first step that 
that I do is we run these transects. So we're running transects usually parallel to the to the ditches on the cranberry bog. So this shows a map of one of the bogs that we mapped up here more recently um, and all of the transects that we ran. You, you try to we try to avoid hopping too many of the of the ditches to make it as easy as possible, but there is a lot of jumping over those ditches that's involved with the field work in that. Um, and this just shows an image of of us here on the mapping one of the bogs dragging the antenna. The other part of that, other than just dragging the antenna along, is that we do we have to ground truth uh, locations to make sure that we're using the correct um, dielectric constant when we're when we're actually measuring the depths of the of the peat here. So we'll select on the on the radar profile, we will mark a point where there's an identifiable a very clear interface that we can measure on the when we're looking at this on the screen and we'll flag that in the field. We'll go in and then dig dig a hole using a tile spade the tile probe to determine what that interface is. Also, sometimes we'll use the Macaulay peat sampler Oop. to uh, grab samples and and describe the soil. So you can see here the the image at the top is showing some of our what that sanded surface looks like, sort of what Jim had showed with that layer cake appearance with the as they sand it over the course of years and then organic layers form as those cranberries grow. But mostly what we're looking for is just that depth, that depth to that interface. And so that's the ground truth process. And so what we end up with is that the radar profile. So this is a nice profile, like Jim had shown before, of the of one of our transects going across one of the bogs. And so you can see it goes the the bottom photo there is just showing this is what a what a cranberry bog looks like at the surface. There's no indication there of any depth of any change in depth of of peat. So having these kind of profiles is really useful for any kind of planning or any kind of identification of where those deep areas are and where those shallow areas are for for um, construction of dikes, for for renovating the bogs, and for things like that. Once we gather all the data, then I, I'll bring it back to the office and process it using Radian. So I use the Radian software. The first step that I that I go through is doing the, that this time zero correction if anybody's working with that. So this, for those of you that aren't familiar with what these are, this is the, the radar profile. And so it's showing the the red lines are showing where it's it's having a, a strong signal. Um, from the from the radar, the black is is indicating more where it's tra the signal is traveling faster. And so the surface here, this black surface is really the signal traveling through the air. It goes really quickly through the air, and so we want to get rid of that and correct the surface by bringing it back up to, up to zero. And what's below that, this black part below that is indicating the organic material. and then the red, and yellow colors down below is that interface with the with the glacial fluvia with the outwash material below. And so the time zero correction just goes from it looking like this. It brings the surface right up to zero over here. On the left hand side is is showing feet, depth in feet across the top is the distance that we traveled along that transect. And so that's the, just the that what we call the time zero correction that we run through. The second step that I that I go through is adjusting the dielectric constant. So Jim talked a little bit about how how GPR works. And so the the signal travels at different speeds through different materials. A lot of that has to do with how wet or dry the material is. And you can see up in the right hand side, I have one of the charts of what those different dielectric constants are for different materials. And so this is going to determine, first of all, how deep you can you can penetrate using that using the GPR and also um, it's, it's going to, if if you change that dielectric constant, it's going to change what it's interpreting that actual depth is. You can see on this on this image here, I have it 
measured in feet on the left hand side. So that's that's it calculating based on what that dielectric constant is. So in these bogs, usually we're starting off with something around 50 or 59 as our dielectric constant because it's they're saturated soils. Um, but it really can change depending on how wet or dry the area is and how um, and and also that that sanded surface, how how wet or dry that area is. So that's where we're using our the ground truth information that we gathered when we were in the field to just confirm that we're using the correct dielectric constant for our any of our corrections. The other nice thing about working in Radan is that you can you can export it to Google Earth now that we have it all hooked up with the GPS. It's collecting GPS information right there on the fly with all of our um, GPR information. And so there's a there's a part in Radan where you can just export it to Google Earth, confirm where your where your um, transect was going. Where those, if you took any marks or or took any field notes, where those are um, spatially, geospatially, and so I find that Google that Google Earth tool there is very useful. What I do in order to make these maps for our cranberry bogs is I in Radian I then go in and pick these points, and so you can see these little yellow points that are selected here. I'm identifying the, that interface between the organic and the mineral material, so the bottom of that kettle bog, um, picking those points along the profile, and then exporting that as an XYZ file. And what that turns into is an XYZ lat, with lat long and the depths of the, the depth of that interface, and that's exported into ArcGIS as just a point file. And then from that point file, I interpolate the surface using the ArcGIS tools. Usually it's either, um, sometimes I've used Krieging analysis, sometimes I've used the nearest neighbor. Um, sort of depends on the, it depends on the location on what works best for interpolating those surfaces or how many points we've gathered, how many of those um, transects we've run. But it ends up being a, a contour map or a 3D map that looks like this that we've created out of out of um, ArcGIS. So what do we use this information for? Jim went over a lot of the a lot of the uses for GPR, but on these bogs, a lot of times historically it's been more for bog renovation or putting in dikes. As Jim had mentioned, the renovation is in the in the process of cranberry growing, they'll occasionally take off all of the all of the plants that are growing there and replant it. And so they'll take them all off, apply new sand. So this is sand being applied to the surface to a histosol to the surface of um, an organic soil, and they'll replant it there. And so knowing knowing where your areas of deep organic low strength soils are is useful if you're doing this process because you wouldn't want to bring your heavy equipment in those in those if you're and also like Jim had said if we're putting in dikes or um, things like that on the bogs knowing this information is really useful this is what the soil profile looks like after a renovation you don't have any of that layering going on um, but it's the sand over the organic material more and more in southeastern Massachusetts, we've been using this these um, this data for bog restoration. And so the cranberry cranberries don't make as much money as they once did for Massachusetts farmers. And so a lot of people are looking to get out of the business. And these are historic wetland areas. And so they are. Be, they can be purchased as wetland easements and wetland restoration sites. And so we've found, we've worked a lot with the D Division of Ecological Restoration here in Massachusetts, who has been, been spearheading a lot of these restoration efforts. And they have found this GPR data to be really useful in their restoration designs because they're looking for those deep kettle holes within these 
bogs because it really affects how the hydrology works. And if they're trying to restore hydrology, they really want to know how it's moving, how the water is moving in these subsurface areas. And so in this example here, so the those are the con on the left hand side, those are the contour lines of depths, depth of organic material. Um, the green green and blue are the deep areas the red is is very shallow so those are the more mineral soils and then on the right hand side is the the proposed restoration design for this area so in a cranberry bog with the the goal of in those with these bogs having those straight ditches is really to move the water off of the soil surface as quickly as possible that's why they have all those ditches on there they flood them occasionally but cranberries don't really want to be wet all the time they want to grow in that sand and they want to be fairly well drained when they're when they're trying to grow. And so, basically, what cranberry bogs have done is they've taken that wetland hydrology away from a lot of from these from a historic wetland. And what we're trying to do is restore that. And so they want to restore the stream, as you can see in this blue, the blue line, that will um, maintain keep the surface of the soil wet for a longer period of time. And so they'll use our GPR data, the detailed information on how deep those organic materials are to, for one thing, to relocate the stream channel. And they'll want to relocate it along, oftentimes along the area where it's most, where there's a very steep or abrupt change from the really deep organics to the shallow organics. They found that that's where a lot of times in these in these areas where the water the groundwater is moving the most and will will keep the that stream channel filled with water, and then they'll also use these little green areas in this restoration map are sites that they identified to make like open water areas. Um, so those are typically in those deeper organics where there's more groundwater to be had, and they'll they'll be um, stay wet most of the time. These are just a few photos of some of the cranberry bog restorations that that we've done. So on the left hand side is the before. Uh, you can see those are those are white pines that are coming up on a on the cranberry bog. If you just leave these be, they are they often will not restore to wet their wetland hydrology. There's all that sand on the surface makes them dry enough that they they just become dry like pine forest, pitch pine and white pine in this area. With some with a little bit of restoration, this right hand photo is show shows the they could dig it out a little bit and restore that hydrology. And that's where we have the wetland. This is part of um Tidmarsh is one of the big restoration sites that we had. So on the left hand side you can see the the straight ditch of the cranberry bog. That's an abandoned cranberry bog with some of the grass growing up in it. And then what they did with the restoration is just go in and make that channel a little bit more, a little bit windier. Um, and also following following the areas where you're gonna have the hydrology continuing to fill that, fill that channel. And just over the course of the summer, the photo on the top right hand side is the begin is March. Photo on the bottom, I think it's I think it says September. Um, so that's the beginning of the restoration and then the seed bank just filled right in once you have the the hydrology. Looking at the soils themselves, so this is the surface soil surface um, top like 40 centimeters uh, between on the left hand side is a is a recently abandoned cranberry bog. So you can see that layered the layered sands and organic material. And then a very, a very thin organic surface that's beginning to form. After this is one of our restoration sites after five years on the right hand side, and you can see how much organic matter has just accumulated once that hydrology has been restored, and it's still over top of all the sand. They don't actually take the sand off because it it becomes a disposal, an issue of figuring out how to dispose of it for one thing. Um, but it's been shown that you can restore these sites just right over top of that that sanded surface. One more picture of the restorations. Um, this is just 
still Tidmarsh, the vegetation that happens over the course of just the summer. The seed bank is really this top right hand photo is the organic, the old cedar swamp um, material that's found underneath that sanded surface. And the seed bank is still there. They don't need to go in and reseed these. It's maintained within that organic material as long as you can bring a little bit of that up to the surface um, and and bring the hydrology back. These that the restoration is sort of happens on its own based on the seed bank that's stored in those soils. And finally, I just so that's that's all I've got on the cranberry bog restoration. And that's really the uses that we have that the main use that we've used our GPR for in the recent years here in southeastern Massachusetts and cranberry country. Um, Olga showed this map early in the when we first started that's just the suitability for GPR suitability across the, the country. We've always um, been under the impression that like Jim had said, we, you can't use GPR in salt marshes, partly based on this map and <laughs> partly um, because the, the signal would just be attenuated in the in the salty soils. Um, but we have a lot of interest in mapping our, our salt marshes. In Massachusetts, we have most all of our salt marshes are mapped as complexes. Um, this is one of one of the areas that we have. And so we don't have detailed information on the depth of organic material. If we could do something similar that we're doing in freshwater using the GPR, that would be really beneficial to us. And like I said, right now, this is a web soil survey, ground penetrating radar map for suitability for mapping these areas. But um, so it's saying it's unsuited for all of our salt marshes. We have currently, we, we have all of these salt marsh areas. This is a an aerial photo of a big salt marsh here in Massachusetts, and this is currently how we can determine the depth of of organic material in those by just using the tile probe and and walking walking transects. It has, like both Olga and Jim said, um, we were all really interested in in hearing Peter Leach from GSSI showing some information on using this in our salt marsh areas and so this this is i think probably one of the one of the profiles that jim did over the summer we've got we do have some promising data that it looks like it can be used for in in these kind of areas and so i think especially using jim your new your new hs unit i am excited to to try this out a little bit more and maybe get some better maps of some of our salt marsh areas. And so hopefully more to come on that. And maybe in the, in the next year after this summer, Jim, we'll be able to do a presentation on how well that's, this works in salt marshes. Um, but that's all I've got. And so I will stop sharing. And if anybody has questions for either of us, that would be great. We did um, have some questions in the chat, and um, some of them you actually answered during your presentation, so maybe I'll work backwards. Um, the last question was, did you do any soil testing to see if there were any residual pesticides? That's that's for your, your uh, uh, the restoration, right? Yeah, I... I wasn't involved in that, but it was. I know that in some of them they were they were testing because there are there are residual pesticides, and that's one of the reasons that they can't remove those sands when they're doing the restorations. Um, there was a question asking how many soil borings you do for ground truthing, and that kind of, for me at least, it depends on the site um, and and how the site keeps changing or doesn't change. Um, I don't know if you guys want to add that. I don't, you don't have a set number of ground truthing um, borings that we typically do. Um, yeah, to, to calibrate the radar, um, radar signal, again, I, I never used a radar, so I'm, I'm old school. I, I, I had the, the paper printout with an engineering scale and basically 
ran the calculations to determine the, the velocities there. So the more data points we had that said, at this point, it's this depth, the better um, our data was. Um, and as Maggie mentioned, it, it did kind of vary. Uh, we look at the dielectric constant, again, from 1 to 80, 81 for water. And you kind of had to pick a value and go with it there. Um, the differences wasn't that much, um, but there are variabilities based on how thick the sand is, the moisture content. I also think some of the, the nutrients that are within it um, change the velocity there. So we did do quite a bit of um, deep uh, poking around, you know, putting steel rods together 20, 30 feet. I, I, I think that the deepest we were able, ever able to go with the 120 antenna was maybe 30 feet in the peat bogs. I'd be interested in trying out the new HS and see if it can go deeper. So um, most of our bogs are kind of shallow here in Rhode Island, so I might have to head out to Massachusetts there and try it out. And I would say, you know, being able to ground truth as much as you can, that um, that really is the strength of the radar. You can't run it on its own. You know, it's always important to ground truth. Um, I think with the radar too, it'll let you click, right? Click that interface and it'll trace the entire thing and provide yeah. a a lot more data. So I got to I got to try this rate right thing. Yeah, it'll do the interpolation. Yep. There's a lot of fancy bells and whistles in there now. Um, OK, so then we have another question on how wide the GPR penetrates into the ground. Is it just the width of the machine or does it shoot into a cone shape? Yeah, I think it's con con conical shape, um, uh, depending on the, the uh, center frequency of the antenna. Um, so usually, uh, again, for our work, those transects like we, Maggie and I were showing, we're pretty far apart, maybe every 50 feet we're running. If you're doing something like, uh, you know, looking for cultural resources or burials or stuff like that, you tend to do every half meter. Um, just to make sure you cover the entire ground. And that's using the, the high frequency 400 to 500 megahertz antenna. Uh, but it is a more of a conical shape that the, the pulse is being transmitted. Right. And then an early question was about, um, does the radar verify the buried material specifically? And I guess I would say not specifically. What you're looking at is the changes in travel time for uh, for the frequency of the antenna you're using, and that's why um, ground truthing is so important. You're seeing that change in the strata, and you want to ground truth to verify what that change in the strata is. Yeah, it's important to note that it's a lot of people would think like you would like a, a granite slab and sand would show up like ringing a bell but in theory they both have the same electrical properties so you actually wouldn't see a granite slab in a sandy soil uh, because they're the same electromagnetic so the, the radar is detecting changes in electrical properties not like density or anything like that so you really want a contrast of two different um, electrical properties to to get that nice interface so that that peat mineral interface that we keep showing is basically going from a peat which is um, you know a 40 or so dielectric constant to your, your wet sands, which is probably like a 30. So that's that's making a nice um, reflector, basically. And then we had someone make a comment. Another option for salt marshes could be multi-frequency EM device, like an AM, AEMP14. Um, they see 20 to 30 feet with 14 measurements in depth. And would not be limited, but in clay or salty soils. If you have info um, on what that is, send it. I'm I'm working on equipment list list, and I was told yeah. to make it make it large. So apparently we we're expecting. I actually put in for another radar too, I, just because I was told to. They told me to <laughs> buy buy two more boats, so I need to. So um, so yeah, if you, if you have info on that on that unit, I know Jim, we've done uh, EMI on salt marshes. And it does work. Uh, the, the problem is trying to correlate the um, the EM data with the the depths. Um, I don't think we ever went that far, but we do get information just with the, an EM unit on on our salt marshes. But um, I don't think we actually used it for mapping. Like the radar will give you a visual where that interface is. The EM you have to do a lot of um, 
calibrating, I guess, of the of the unit. Uh, yeah. they, they've also talked about very low frequency, like sub bottom profiling um, to try to use acoustics on the salt marshes, but we've never had any any luck with anything like that. And he did mention Zach and Butler in New, Zach Butler in New, North Carolina, so he would be one to reach out to. 